So the scene opens. Jesus is teaching in the temple. The scribes and the Pharisees drag in a woman to the very center of the room, right where Jesus is teaching. She's not there willingly. She clearly does not want to be there. Head hung, quiet, frightened. She's been caught in the act of adultery, and the spiritual leaders make her stand before the crowd right there in the temple, right between them and Jesus, right where the teaching is happening. She is to be made an example of. She is the very lesson. And they say to Jesus, teacher, Moses says we ought to stone people like her. So what do you say? You know when you're asked a question and there's not a right answer? That's what's happening here. It's a trap. They're using this woman in the law to gain proof against Jesus. How would Jesus, the one who ate with tax collectors and spent time with sinners, respond to this clear case of sin? Will Jesus honor Roman law or God's law? Remember that this temple is in Roman territory. The Israelites are living under the rule of the Romans. And in Roman law, Israel does not have the ability to sentence anyone to death without the approval of the Roman ruler of the area. Hence why Jesus later must go before the government to be sentenced to death. Israel does not have the authority to make that verdict. But in the Torah, in Israel's religious law, the law stated that both the adulteress and the adulterer must be put to death in Leviticus 20.10. These laws stand in opposition of one another. So which law will Jesus choose as the right law? Even as they ask him, the crowd is picking up stones. They are eager. And the woman knows what's coming. She's in the temple, after all. And Jesus, in all his mystery, responds, not with words, but by ignoring their question and bending to the ground in order to write in the dirt. Impatient with Jesus, the teachers and the Pharisees continue to demand an answer from Jesus. What is he even doing, playing in the dirt? And the woman stands there, waiting to become the lesson, just ready to get it over with. She has no hope here alone in the middle of the temple. And at long last, Jesus straightens up and looks the religious leaders right in the eye. The crowd quiets, ready to hear what he will say. The woman stays silent, ready for the verdict, preparing herself for the stones. And then Jesus shares his interpretation of the law. Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. After commanding the sinless to throw the first stone, Jesus stoops down to the ground again and writes in the dirt again. I can only imagine what must be going through this woman's head, what she must have felt in that moment. And it is only at this point that the scribes and the Pharisees leave the place, the older ones first. One by one, they drop their stones and leave. Some deflated, some frustrated, maybe some angry. They leave until it is only Jesus riding in the sand and a woman left standing there. And Jesus asks her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, she says. No longer does this woman stand between Jesus and the men who would use the law to kill her. Now it is only the woman and Jesus, the giver and interpreter of the law. And Jesus tells her, 
that neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In the church, I think we hear the story and like to associate ourselves with Jesus. We take on the role of calling out the sin in others and then saying, go and sin no more. But the reality is, when we decide to see ourselves as Jesus in the story, I think we've missed the point of the story. Sometimes we are the woman, vulnerable, caught in our own sin, sometimes publicly, sometimes not. Standing in the middle with everyone watching, trapped, ashamed, nowhere to go and nowhere safe to hide. We feel like the means to an end, thrown into the middle of the crowd, used as the very ground on which this religious debate will be fought. Sometimes we are the Pharisees. They were doing the biblical thing, you know, these teachers of the law and religious leaders. And sometimes we do that too. Quoting a scripture to justify our actions. After all, the law tells us that we can. Never mind that we're all only following half of the law that serves our own purpose. Law over grace. Law over mercy. Law over love. Making a scene, standing in our pride and judgment, ready to throw the stone all in the name of righteousness. And on our better days, maybe we're at least the older Pharisees, the ones who, when Jesus calls us out, recognize that if we punish for every law, for every sin, that not a one of us would be left standing. But we still participated in dragging the woman to the temple to suit our own motives. Yes, throughout our lives, we find ourselves in the presence of Jesus in a variety of ways, as the accuser and the accused, as the righteous rule follower and as the vulnerable rule breaker, broken and prideful and broken and suffering. And to all of our questions and motives, Jesus quietly bends down and writes in the sand writes in the dirt and the dust of the world. There is a practice in the season of Lent, the season leading up to Easter, called Ash Wednesday. I love Ash Wednesday. We are physically marked on our foreheads in ashes with the sign of the cross, and we remember. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you will return. Like Adam, we are created out of earth by creator God's own hand. And when we die, our bodies will return to the earth. You and I are made of earth, of dirt and dust. And it is here in the dirt that Jesus begins to write. And what is written in the sand? Maybe Jesus is bored, just doodling. Who knows? Maybe Jesus writes the Ten Commandments, as church tradition has long suggested, that Jesus writes the commandments to remind the Pharisees that no one is above the law, that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe Jesus writes her sins, Acknowledging that he knows who she is and what she has done, that he sees her just as she is, and he is still there with her. Maybe Jesus writes her future, writes of the good news that he has come to share, that there is hope in life for everyone if we'll just follow. Writes a reminder of who she is, created, beloved, in God's own image. What is written in the sand? You and I, we have our own laws, 
our own rules and regulations of what a good Christian looks like. We have labels we assign to those who don't fit in. We make conditions that we put on God's grace. We assign a hierarchy of sins that we cling to to make ourselves feel better. We go through a checklist of behaviors that we use to determine one another's righteousness. We think that we need the police for God, and in doing so, we forget that we are all sinners, that we have all needed God's grace and mercy. I think that Jesus knew that the Pharisees and this woman, they really weren't so different after all, were they? And you and I, we aren't that different either. Our stones may be invisible, but we all carry them. And as we look at what Jesus has written in the sand, a reminder of our own humanity, of the transience of our lives, may we also stop to reconsider our own role in throwing stones. As we imagine what it looks like to empty ourselves in the way of Christ, we come to this place, this community. We come to scripture, to God's holy and living word. And we find both justice and mercy, both righteousness and grace. And what's fascinating to me about this story is that everyone walks away. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the woman. And no one walks away sinless except for Jesus. Whatever is written in the sand reveals that righteousness and justice are good things, but only when they are born out of grace. And when we walk away, we go and sin no more. Jesus makes that sound so simple, but at 37, I have yet to be successful in this command. I have known Jesus my whole life. I decided I wanted to become a minister at age 10, and I committed my life to God in baptism at age 15, but I have yet to achieve sinning no more. I try, I do, it's just a whole lot easier to teach God's laws than it actually is to follow all of them myself. Because on Monday, life gets busy, and I forget what we talked about on Sunday. And let me tell you, pride sneaks in, or I get angry and I take it out on my spouse. And that gossip sounds interesting, so spill the tea. And I weave stories in my head about what I think is happening, but it's not centered in reality. And I'm tired driving home and don't let that person in the lane. And I worry about my future and my loved ones so I invite greed in as I hoard what I think I need right now. And then I feel bad about all those other things, so gluttony visits, and I think it'll make me feel better. And spoiler alert, it doesn't. But this is not what it looks like to empty ourselves in the way of Christ. As we imagine what it looks like to empty ourselves in the way of Christ, perhaps it looks like the woman caught in adultery going and sinning no more. Not that our sin doesn't matter so we can keep doing it. Not sin no more because you fear stoning, but sin no more because you have come face to face with the living God. And he has shown you what it means to experience grace. We take the chance to reestablish righteousness in our lives because we now know what it means to have been shown mercy. Jesus shows mercy and holds back the hands of those that accuse us, and they drop the stones and leave themselves. And you and I also leave, stepping over the stones our accusers have left behind, free to go and choose righteousness. As we imagine what it looks like to empty ourselves in the way of Christ, it looks like the teachers of the law and the Pharisees laying down the stones. Emptying ourselves in the way of Christ might look like walking away, look like offering grace and compassion and love 
above the law, not becoming heartless hypocrites who have forgotten what grace looks like. Instead of condemning one another, we are convicted that there is a better way, that you are not alone as you seek to follow that way, that there is good news and that is being spoken to every one of us right here, right now. This story is not about condemnation. It's about conviction. When it is time for the verdict to be made, Jesus bends down and writes in the sand. The God who formed us out of dust, now writing in it. And what is written in the sand? What happens when here in the dirt, where we have come from and where we will go, Jesus touches down his finger and begins to write. The verdict is given, and it is not what we expect. Not condemnation, but conviction. Jesus doesn't condemn us. No, Jesus stares in the face of our sin, and he convicts us, inviting us to do better, to be better, to start again, to be transformed into Jesus' own image that we might go and sin no more. As we imagine what it looks like to empty ourselves in the way of Christ, it looks like imitating Jesus until we are made new. Emptying ourselves in the way of Christ looks like meeting people where they are with dignity and grace showing tough love to the accusers and gentle love to the vulnerable. This week, may you meet Jesus and experience both God's justice and mercy. May you see what is written in the sand, and may you go and sin no more, instead choosing the way of righteousness and grace. Amen.